For those of you who regularly attend this event, you will know that we normally entertain our guests to a sumptuous lunch hosted in our lovely offices. As I stare at the depressing looking homemade sandwich and the packet of biscuits I've managed to scavenge from another meeting room um, and have spent the last three months at home working in my office there, I can testify to the fact that things are not normal. Since the middle of March, we have faced the biggest public health crisis that this country has had to confront in back It does seem that this crisis is now subsiding. And as the lockdown restrictions continue to ease, then we can hope for the resumption of some level of normal economic activity in the coming weeks and months. However, the fallout from the lockdown is likely to cast a dark shadow out over our economy for some time to come. That said, all is not lost. There will be opportunities that will come out of this situation, and those that can respond to this crisis quickly are the ones who will be able to survive this economic situation. Birmingham is ideally placed at the centre of our country to cement our position as a key economic outside of London. I'm delighted to welcome Paul Falconer to speak to us today to discuss this city's response to the crisis and what our position is in the post-COVID world. After a career in business and in football management, including a period as Chief Executive of Aston Villa, Paul was appointed as the CEO of Birmingham Chamber in 2015. Since then, he's been a keen advocate of Birmingham and has taken a significant role in raising the profile of the region during the lockdown. We are delighted to have him here as our guest today. After Paul's talk, there will be an opportunity for questions. Evidently, our time today with Paul is limited, and I'll try to ask as many questions as I possibly can. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function as indicated on your screen, and I'll ask them at the end of Paul's talk. We're hoping that the presentation, that the whole event today will last for approximately an hour, and we hope to allow you back to your, uh, your normal afternoon by two o'clock today. Paul, over to you. Hi, thank you, Peter, and, uh, and good afternoon, everybody. I can see Peter on my screen, but I can't see anyone else. So I hope you can all hear me and the video is working okay. And uh, yeah, I think we're getting used to this sort of way of working now, aren't we? Um, so yeah, I think, you know, when you're, you're talking about the whole COVID situation and coronavirus and trying to stare into the, the crystal ball around the future, I always think, you know, where do you start really? Um, the, the, the scale of this is um, just quite remarkable. And I think we're sort of seeing that on a, on a day by day basis and starting to really wrap our heads around it. I mean, just a little bit of scene setting, first of all, in terms of um, the, the Chamber of Commerce. So the Greater Birmingham Chambers of Commerce, we <clears throat> represent nearly three and a half thousand businesses across our region now, an independent, not for profit uh, organization. And now our core purpose really is to, to help support businesses, to connect them together, and in the normal uh, order of business, to help them, them grow. I think right now and since the, the middle of March and the onset of uh, COVID-19, you know, we've, our focus has been very much on helping to do all that we can to keep business moving here in the region. Certainly an awful lot of support around coronavirus, um, trying to help businesses to navigate the, the glut of government support schemes, doing quite a lot of translation if that makes sense from you know when these were coming out and they've been popping out over time at different uh different days weekends late in the evening and so we've been trying to make sure that businesses are aware of the support that does exist uh exactly what the the sort of rules of the road are and how they can access that support both on the national and uh and the local level um a lot in recent times uh, now switching to the return to work how businesses can can do that safely uh, and the sort of elements they need to be thinking through as that return to work does ramp up, as, as Peter said. Um, we've also been doing an awful lot of lobbying. I guess we've been fortunate at the Chamber to always have uh, good relationships um, with stakeholders uh, across the patch, certainly again locally, regionally and nationally with, uh, with MPs and government. Um, but certainly since the, the crisis has hit, we've seen access to the various levels of government uh, increased massively. They've, they've you know, got that open door. We've been able to uh, speak with them. And so, you know, both privately and constructively and sometimes a little bit more hardly when we're lobbying on behalf of, of businesses, um, we know that those messages are landing, not always having direct results. Sometimes they are, 
the key, I think, for, for ourselves and for the businesses who we work with is that we can get the, the messages through to government. We can get tangible examples of where people are, are falling through the gaps in the support into government and see if we can get changes made. I think everyone recognises there's been an awful lot of support put out there. It's been developed at quite a pace. And so it hasn't always been perfect, to say the least. I think we've seen a good amount of flexibility from government where needed in, in terms of amending and adjusting. And that's where the lobbying comes in so importantly. Uh, in fact, uh, just after this call, we've got a, another session uh, with the British Chambers and uh, the Secretary of State for, for DWP, who have just been reading prior to this, has got herself embroiled in a row with Marcus Rashford around free school meals. So um, it be interesting to see how that goes. But again, another opportunity for us to get the messages that the businesses are trying to say and the support that they need through to the top levels of government. And then there, the th third strand of, that we've really been focusing on in recent times is communications and helping to spread messages of our members. And just you know, quite often it's as simple as the fact that we are open for business. This is what we're trying to do. Uh, it's been a strange time as we all know. And I think that uh, communicating clearly and effectively has never been more important. And you know, the chamber, we've got a really strong B2B uh, network, lots of different channels, uh, digital channels. We're still also been producing our magazine. And so it's been uh, really, really critical that we're able to get business messages out there to the wider community. So lots going on. I mean, I think when thinking about the, the post COVID, COVID world, it's important to probably take that step back and just to realize what a, a total systemic shock this is, not just to, to the city of Birmingham, not just to our region, or country but you know the entire globe really and it's impacted all facets of life so you know that word unprecedented is being used an awful lot right now but um it's very very true and so you know the pathway to recovery is going to be complex and the scale of that recovery is certainly going to be challenging um you know and while locking down was relatively simple in hindsight and certainly i think businesses uh, have adapted very, very well to remote working, probably better than uh, than many thought they would do. Uh, it's clear that the unlock is going to be far more complex and less uniform. Um, what I thought I would just do as well is a little bit of um, some additional context to where we are on the scale of the challenge. And so this comes with a, a health warning. This is a lunch event. And so if you are eating uh, your lunch, I apologise if some of this won't be too palatable. But at the same time, it's important that we do recognise the, the scale of things. So at the Chamber this morning, in fact, we've um, just released our, our quarterly business uh, report. Um, every quarter we go out and survey businesses on a range of different indicators and get their sentiment on the period ahead. We've been holding data for this for 33 years now. So it's a good data set and we're able to sort of compare quarter on quarter how the, the regional economy is feeling and doing and what the outlook is. and when we measure that against uh, various national measures, we see that it's a great indicator of general economic health. So this quarter, uh, we, ain't, we had a record number of responses, most we've ever had, um, which in some ways is, is, is good. But unfortunately, we had the worst set of uh, economic indicators that we've seen in 33 years of doing this report. And that was across every single benchmark. So, you know, when you think about 08, 09 and the financial crash, we're kind of in territory, which is certainly outstripping that. We saw um, the manufacturing and service sector both uh, report dramatic uh, reductions in domestic demand. 80% uh, of manufacturers said domestic demand had declined in the past quarter, 70% of the service sector. In terms of exports, again, uh, services and manufacturers, both of them down over 50% in both cases. 30% of businesses were saying they were had already reduced their workforce uh, in this period. And I'll come on to the jobs figures uh, later. We had 54% of responders saying that they were cutting CapEx spend and 45% were cutting their, their training spend. And over 50% of everyone who responded uh, said they expected turnover and profitability to decline in the next 12 months. We'd never seen those indicators um, over a 50 percent um, in terms of negative sentiment so the the the, the qbr the quarterly business report um is very sobering what i'll do um i'll either stick a link to it in the uh, the chat or i'm sure the team at clark will not be able to send a link around if people want to to dive into that 
in a little bit more more detail. You may also have seen the ONS release the latest jobs figures today. And so I just sort of printed these off beforehand. I think the national numbers uh, had 2.8 million people now claiming benefits, which is up uh, 600,000 since March. And that's with over 9 million people still being picked up by the furlough scheme right now. But just to bring that down to a, a Birmingham City Council level, um, the number of claimants right now has gone up to 77,000, nearly 78,000 people, uh, which is the highest level since 1987. And since February, we've seen the number of people uh, claiming uh, unemployment benefits increase by 60%. So that's through to May but I think just gives a sense of the, the scale of the impact that is already being felt. And um, I'm sure there will be, you know, sort of more to come, as I say, as the furlough scheme tapers off. So, you know, the, the data is bad. It's probably not a, a shock given what we have gone through. Um, so it doesn't feel good when it's laid out in sort of stark numbers in front of you. But I think it, it's important that we don't bury our heads in the sand. It's important, we un important that we understand the full scale of this. Certainly, from a chamber point of view, we, we you will be using these results, and we already are, to lobby government to, again, emphasise the need uh, for support to continue and where we can get it more targeted, and also for some smart decisions to be made on certain measures, um, which I'll touch on later. And, and, you know, it just it gives a sense that I'm sure people would have heard uh, conversations around what type of recovery are we going to have. And in the early days, people were talking about a quick bounce back and a V recovery. And you know, sometimes it was maybe going to extend out to a, a U-shaped recovery where we'd sort of take a little bit longer to get back to the levels where we were before. The, the pessimists were talking about an L-shaped recovery where you know, the, we drop off the cliff and then continue on a, a lower line. And um, I think the most optimistic I've heard right now is that it's going to look something like a Nike swoosh. And you know, we're seeing lots of graphs with uh, straight lines plummeting downwards but as we say hopefully um we're getting towards the bottom of that and we're going to start seeing an upturn which as i say will be uh, far more complex i think than the the switch off of the economy um and i think that's really one of the areas where you can see it right now where government are trying to to get the the balance right between restarting the economy unlocking uh, getting people back to work getting shops open which happened on on Monday and then the hospitality industry in the coming period, but but doing that that safely uh, and in a way which which minimises the risk of a of a second wave, as as Peter touched on earlier. I mean, just a little bit on the the health side of um, things. I had a conversation with Justin Varney, Dr. Justin Varney, who's a director of public health in Birmingham. And again, he participated in our um, our quarterly business uh, event this morning but he was saying that you know about four out of five people in the uk haven't yet had uh covid so far and we're still in in birmingham just in birmingham itself still getting around five or ten cases a day now that's significantly down from where it was a month ago when we were up over 100 cases a day so definitely trending in the right direction but what i found particularly interesting was his take on social distancing and sort of saying that, you know, there is no doubt that it does make a big difference and asked him about the difference between two metres and one metre social distancing, which is a topic which is really live at the moment. And it's a very um, sort of great way of describing this. And the difference between having two metres to one metre, according to the science, is that if you can imagine a room of 100 people, if you're socially distancing at one metre, then... 33 people in that room are likely to catch or will catch coronavirus. If you're at two meters, then that number goes to three out of 100. And so um, from a scientific point of view, very clear that uh, two meters remains uh, an important distance for minimizing the potential spread. But I think as you balance it up with the need to unlock the economy, um, and certainly that's something obviously that the chamber we are we're keen to do but keen to do safely uh, I suspect that we may not see a straight switch from one to the other but there may well be nuances because you know, two meters is when you're sat face to face but actually if you're side by side or back to back etc then there's going to be more leeway and so it'd be interesting to see what rules are, are sort of passed down from government certainly for the hospitality industry restaurants bars hotels 
um, etc. in the coming period. We're still um, expecting an awful lot to be uh, unlocked around the 4th of July, but waiting for the confirmation right now. So it is, it is complex, the unlocking. Um, been talking to some businesses who have unlocked over the past few weeks and seen business absolutely booming and in some ways helping them to make up for some of the uh, period where they, they were locked down. Um, one member of ours who owns a number of uh, restaurants in the train has, has opened up its limited, limited menu, uh, limited opening hours, certainly compared to what they normally have. They've had a massive surge in demand. And of course, with the, the limitations uh, around times, and that means different shift patterns, et cetera, he said that they've been more profitable than ever. They're actually seeing demand up over a, a trading would normally be over a 24 hour period, but their costs are significantly down because they've got a limited menu and say spending less on staff costs. So you can sort of see how some industries are bouncing back. Others, of course, don't have the opportunity to right now. I mentioned hospitality. You think about culture and the arts, um, and that's an area which is you know, significantly challenged here in Birmingham. The Hippodrome have already confirmed that they won't be open until at least November. I'm, uh, one of the roles I have is as vice chair of, of Symphony Hall Town Hall, and I'm uh, trying to work out how do we get Symphony Hall back open safely? How can you make the, the numbers work where socially distance, you've got a hall where you can get a couple of thousand people in normally, but suddenly you're limited to two, 300, maybe a few more, but that doesn't become um, financially viable for some of the, the acts who would normally be playing. So you can't attract them and suddenly you've got a lot of dark days and if you're bringing staff back up, then but you haven't got the income coming in, again, you're just not viable. So um, certainly it was there we're looking at, at the furlough scheme, which has been the lifeline for, for so many businesses. But with that now tapering off from July and ceasing from October, businesses are looking ahead and I think really is trying to take stock as to what happens next. And there's a clear need, I think, for additional support. May not be uh, the furlough scheme as was, but it may well be uh, some sort of iteration of, uh, on a less universal way than we've seen to date, but certainly to help those businesses who can't trade right now. Same, um, should just touch briefly on, on aviation, where it's slightly different. Um, but, you know, Birmingham Airport, for example, is a massive uh, regional um, uh, economic driver. I think it adds about 1.5 billion GVA to our economy every single year. And um, I think there were some flights just starting um, from Air France actually um, this week, but uh, been operating at about 3% capacity in recent weeks. And when you just think of that in terms of every business, it's absolutely crippling. So it's important that we get that um, functioning again. But then something such as the quarantine rules, which have been introduced, started last Monday, um, just not helping the industry to be able to get back to, to work just doesn't seem fair, let alone the, the actual health benefits of that. So there's an awful lot of lobbying going on around there for those uh, rules to be re released so that, that aviation and the airport can get back functioning in some way and again can start sort of um, fueling our, our regional economic recovery. So, I mean, just switching a little bit more into um, the region and, and what is going on around the, the recovery. Um, there's a lot while recognising the, the complexity. Um, from a West Midlands Combined Authority uh, perspective, the mayor uh, is leading a lot of activity right now. He's got an economic uh, impact group, which was set up very quickly as the, uh, the crisis started to um, hit. Uh, the chamber sits on there. And so we're able to, again, feed in the voice of our members and the broader business community together with uh, um, a whole host of regional stakeholders, other business groups and some um, uh, leading um, private employers as well. Right now, they're focused probably on, on three key things. One, we're expecting, they're calling it a fiscal event. So it's not a budget. It's going to be a fiscal event from government at the start of July, probably the, the second, maybe the third week of July. And so um, the region is working up a bid right now uh, to come up with sort of shovel ready projects mainly going to be around um, sort of capital uh, and infrastructure um, projects which can get going in the next three six 12 months time so they can really make an impact and provide some jobs but there's a sense that there's going to be some additional financial stimulus available and we want to make sure that the west midlands is right at the front of the queue with some smart 
um, opportunities there. So that that's a work right now. A lot of lobbying going on as well. Definitely the the response to to this is being managed um, centrally down in Whitehall. Understandable in many many ways because uh, it's affecting the whole nation. But at the same time, we need to make sure that that the regions and I think in our region with the, the combined authority structure, we can be well placed to um, know what works best for us. And we want to get some more regional control over uh, the, the various measures and, and options around unlocking. So a lot of lobbying around that. And then a longer term recovery plan, which is aiming to sort of ensure that, 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 that over the sort of next six, 12 months and beyond that we don't just bounce back as a region, but come back better than ever. And I think that a lot of that is around building on uh, strands that were in the local industrial strategy. Certainly there's a lot of focus on, on green growth, on electrification, on sort of the whole autonomous vehicle gigafactory agenda that was starting to emerge prior to coronavirus. I think very much seeing this can be a strength of the region and looking to make sure that as government are looking to um, place investments and place strategic developments, places that, that the West Midlands is at the heart of that. Awful lot of focus on 5G and digital connectivity as well, where we've been a test bed for 5G, want to do more around that. And, and also life sciences. Um, we've sort of had a life science cluster here in the region for some time now, uh, over in Selly Oak around the, the, the QE and the sort of life sciences park. And there's a big focus on driving and developing that, which when you think we're just going through this, this pandemic, um, is going to be something which is going to be a lot of investment in. We need to make sure that that money flows here to the West Midlands, at least in part. So a lot going on at the moment. Just to sort of maybe finish on a, a few positives or a few additional thoughts of areas of focus down the line. I think the green recovery is going to be really, really important. And um, we've seen this probably in sort of certainly through 2019. Um, it rising up the agenda, the sort of the march to carbon neutrality, um, increasingly on the sort of boardroom table and points of discussion. But if your business wasn't thinking about how to go green already, then I would suggest that that's something that you really should be focusing on because an awful lot of the recovery, I think, will be linked to that. And certainly some of the government support or bailouts that we're expecting to see, we think they'll come with green strings, as it's being uh, called, and making sure that Again, we sort of use don't waste a good crisis and use this as a springboard to really sort of drive that 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 green agenda. Um, exporting is going to get an awful lot of attention um, and is starting to already. There's a sort of starting to hear these sort of phrases and buzzwords emerging from government about trading our way um, into a recovery. So again, an area where if your business isn't doing anything overseas right now you think about ways that you might be able to, you've got a product or a service that you could um, export, then you know there's already an awful lot of support around to help businesses to do that. But we expect to see that growing um, in the period ahead as government have a real focus on that. I think at present, I think the stat is that about 18% of businesses who can export do. So it's nowhere near um, sort of any sort of sense of, of, of capacity here. There's an awful lot of Needs, more needs to be done to encourage businesses. People see a lot of barriers around exporting, can find it, it could be quite intimidating or in the, the too hard to do panel. Well, when we've had this economic shock, it's important that you're looking and exploring every possible market. And certainly opportunities overseas are going to be critically important. I can make a nice little plug now um, on that, if, if Peter will forgive me, because uh, next Wednesday, uh, the Chamber, we're running a uh, a trading internationally in a post-COVID world conference um, from 12 o'clock until five that everyone's very welcome to attend, uh, free to jump on. We've got the Secretary of State for International Trade, Liz Trust. We've got the US Ambassador, Woody Johnson. We've got um, a couple of local MPs on there as well. And also some businesses here from the region who are trading overseas and some from overseas who've got their experience. So Jim Shark are joining us and also a company called Halo Top, who make this low calorie ice cream that I've been reading lots about, haven't actually tried any yet. But again, imparting their sort of experience of how to do it well. And I think that um, really getting your mindset around how could you look to export is going to be critical for businesses in the, the period going forward. And then you know, a couple of other points just to flag 
which I suppose are somewhat specific to our region and will help Birmingham and the wider West Midlands to recover. Um, first one, HS2. Um, we've long campaigned for HS2 and extolled the benefits that it's going to bring. It's not about getting between Birmingham and London more quickly. Uh, it's about providing additional capacity to our transport network, which is, is much, much needed, but also the wider um, the ripple effects of that investment into the railway and what it does to the, the regional economy has been um, transformational. I think we've already seen that here in, in Birmingham. You only have to sort of go around East Side or uh, and see where the, the Curzon Street station is going to be to see how that's transformed in the last four or five years. And I think that you know, the project was under review in the autumn. The government took a deep dive, uh, has come back and um, assessed an awful lot of evidence and the value for money continues to be there, always has been there, uh, the return that this is going to give the country. And so they've green, green lighted it, which has been great. We've had notice to proceed uh, earlier in the year and we're now seeing HS2, um, the construction really proceeding at pace. And over the next 10 years, I think the, the jobs that's going to provide that ray of hope for our regional economy, that sense of, of investment and actually attracting fresh money into the region is going to be more important than ever. It was always going to be probably the single most important factor driving our uh, economic renaissance, as we used to call it, um, over the, the next 10 years. I think right now it's going to be absolutely critical. Um, and while that's a benefit for the whole country, I think you know here in, in Birmingham, you know, they're headquartered here and we're going to be at the heart of that new network when it ultimately goes further north and connects up the whole country. So we get a disproportionately positive uh, amount of the benefits. And the other one to flag as well, the other sort of project which is specific to us is the Commonwealth Games in 2022, just over two years away, um, which, you know, if you think of it crudely in, in financial terms, is roughly a, a £750 million investment into the region that we wouldn't be getting otherwise. So it's been an absolute sort of catalyst and is going to continue to do so. We've been having talks this week about some additional funding that's coming through from, from government for a sort of a tourism, a trade and investment uh, bolt on, as it were. So it's not about the, the athletics itself or some of the core programs or the, the athletes village there. This is additional money, which is uh, around stimulating um, overseas interest in our region and helping to showcase all that we do here, helping to showcase businesses. And the expectation is that, that will have like a five-fold return. Um, so great opportunities there, which if we weren't hosting it, they wouldn't be coming our way. It'd be going somewhere else, either in this country or, or throughout the Commonwealth. So um, while not wanting to be blindly optimistic, I think there are uh, a few reasons to be a little bit cheerful at least and to think that we've um, got ahead of where some other areas may be. And that will all be important as we start to pull together for the recovery. So, I mean, that's pretty much me done as a, a bit of a canter through some initial thoughts. I think that the business community here uh, is really, really collegiate in Birmingham. Uh, I guess, you know, what Clark Wilmot are doing with, with these lunches and, and there's a whole host of, of network events which go on around the city. Um, you know, there is that sense of togetherness. Um, I think we're going to need that more than ever, that sense of local pride that's been developing in recent times. I think a, a sense of buying local um, and supporting local businesses or businesses based here is going to be critical. Um, in some ways, maybe again, we've, we've been practicing that in recent times, but we need to sharpen that up even more, and make sure that we are supporting each other. Certainly here at the Chamber, that's what we're committed to do. That's why the Chambers of Commerce exists. It's to help our regional economies, to help our regional businesses, to, to play that part, championing your interests, uh, talking to those uh, in government and making sure that they're listening to us and that you're getting what you need as well as helping to sort of lubricate the, the wheels of commerce amongst ourselves. And so we're fully committed to continuing to do that. Um, certainly, we've got a glut of resources which are freely available to members and others which are available to non-members as well to help you through the current situation. And if there's anything we can do from that chamber, please do reach out and speak to myself or the team. But that was my my sort of opening gambit, Peter. So I hope that's been mildly interesting and, and happy to have a conversation or, or take it wherever we want, really. 
No, that, that's really, really good, Paul. And I think um, uh, one of the things that's nice, having listened to three months' worth of relentlessly negative um, news, is to hear um, your presentation, which is so positive. Um, right, I do have some questions that are, that, are, that are coming in. So, first question, this is on, um, on transport in the city. Uh, any thoughts on transport effects of many more people driving in for fear of using public transport? This person um, has been in the uh, twice recently and found half kings at a premium. Any thoughts on what will happen with the never-ending rush hour when we're back in the offices? Yeah, it's a really good question, isn't it? And it's hard, one of those areas where it's hard to look into the, the crystal ball. Um, I suppose what we do know is that it's a massive focus of the city council. We've been doing a lot of work with them on with their sort of transport planning, which is coming through in, in segments, but you know, they're keen to make Birmingham a, a greener city and certainly less reliant on uh, private transport. We've got the, the clean air zone, um, which will be rolled out in 2021. Uh, we had a session with the council a couple of weeks ago. And I think they've committed to giving six months notice as to when the clean air zone will come in. This has been mandated by the European courts, of course. It was originally due to take effect from January 2020, uh, but we expect to see it probably in quarter one, uh, 2021 now. Um, and that's not a congestion charge, it's a clean air zone. So for example, it's only really gonna impact diesel cars older than 2014 and petrol cars which are older than that. But there is a commitment to trying to clean up the air. There are more measures that the council then um, will be looking at. Uh, we've committed to working with them and the business community and making sure this is done in consultation. Um, I think at the best of times, that's crucial. Um, and at these times, it's absolutely essential because we have to try to strike uh, the balance right now and we want as few fewer unintended consequences to uh, or barriers to to getting back to, to business for businesses as possible uh, and you know constructs such as workplace parking levies which are being talked about will need careful consideration so um, I think that that's the direction of travel in the, the sort of medium term longer term short term it, it, it's very very hard isn't it because the the rules and the restrictions around public transport are going to force people into their cars to get back to work. So as we start to or you know, unlock and more and more people do, that's going to have a knock on impact on our, our road network. Anyone who, who drives around Birmingham, uh, it may have been sort of three or four months since we were last sat in, a, sat in a traffic jam, but it won't take long before that's the, the case again. Um, I suppose one thing that we are picking up speaking to a lot of businesses based in the city centre, a lot of the professional services firms, are that they actually you know, aren't intending to rush back to the office. There'll be a very gradual uh, phased return to work, but a lot are saying that they don't expect to be anywhere near um, previous staffing levels in the office uh, until you know, late in the autumn or in the new year. And you know, new working practices or comfort with working from home uh, could be one way that, that we can make sure that we don't become gridlocked too quickly, because I don't think that's in anyone's interest. So linked in with that then, Paul, um, if businesses move to greater uh, flexible, so this particularly applies, I think, to professional services firms like this, our firm, um, if businesses move to a more flexible working model, um, do you see that's going to have an impact on the way the city centre looks? Because certainly in this part of the city centre, it's almost all uh, professional services firms. They, they surely are going to require less space. I think. I think it's too early to say for sure, Peter. And again, speaking to, to people in the property industry, there's lots of, of different views right now. Um, I know uh, BT in the autumn uh, last year confirmed that they were moving into to Snow Hill 3. It's a huge office development. I think they're gonna have somewhere like four and a half, five thousand 5,000 people based there. Um, and you know, in conversation with them, that's still their plan. So I think it will take some time to, to sort of settle down as to exactly how people are using um, offices. Will we actually you know, need less space? Will we just use our space in a different way? Um, there's also knock on impact, of course, for the city centre, for the shops and retailers and cafes and bars around there if, if we're um, occupying space in a different way. And, and I also just go back to transport. I think there's an opportunity here, which I'm not sure it's been grasped yet, um, but it's something that there are 
conversations around, you know, about trying to use this um, situation to make sure that we don't just go back to sort of previous ways of working and operating, but, you know, linking businesses, business groups, um, likes of schools and colleges as well to see about staggered operating times and to sort of find out if we can actually make a, a seismic shift in when those peaks and troughs are because it's been sort of long talked about but always fallen into the too difficult to do pile whereas it strikes me that there's a real opportunity right now and again anyone who travels in and out of Birmingham on a regular basis if you sort of think of, of school holiday time or you know sort of late July and August normally then the traffic is so much better at previous times. So, so it shows that it can be done, um, but it just needs some joined up thinking uh, from you know, the, the, the private sector and the public sector. Um, but before we get back to just being sort of stuck in the tunnels in your car at, at five o'clock or really from sort of four o'clock, then I think that probably some, some real planning and mapping needs to go on there. This is a question that's kind of linked into what you've been saying, but more from a retail perspective, um, undoubtedly, people have been shopping online far more during the lockdown than they've had to, um, and people have got used to that way of shopping. Is that going to impact the, 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 the centre of Birmingham? Yesterday we saw um, on the, the news, for example, lots of pictures of queues outside Primark, which suggests that people are going to come back and shop. Um, but do you think that online shopping is going to impact people's habits, and are we going to see less of a retail presence in the centre of Birmingham? I think it absolutely is going to impact people's habits. I think it already has been. I think that's been baked in now for you know a couple of years, and we've seen the challenges that the the high street has been facing. And I think this will exacerbate some of that change. Um, I think good businesses will will adapt. I think a lot of the uh, the physical shopping experiences has started to change anyway and become uh, almost more experiential and, and linked into a, a digital approach as well. The best companies marry up. The two really, really uh, effectively, um, you know. And I think in this period as well, we've seen certainly some of the smaller independent retailers and restaurants, for example, adapt. And if they weren't or didn't have an online offering to date, then you know, they've been very innovative and are starting to to do things. People like Loki Wines, based in uh, in the arcade, or, or or Opus Restaurant on Cornwall Street, who are now doing the sort of the dine at home um, opportunity. And will they will those things stick? As our habits sort of change, will people be keen to to get back together as soon as we possibly can? I think it, it's it. I don't have that crystal ball, so I don't know definitively. But I think it certainly sort of shows that you know, the best businesses are going to have to be nimble right now, and you know, sort of really sort of think carefully about how they position themselves. Getting a little bit maybe more dry as well. You know, I think we definitely and we continue to call for a, a fundamental review of, of business rates because it does feel that that. The, the the existing structure is is outdated and penalizes um certain sectors uh who are probably facing the biggest challenges right now such as the, the retailers and i mean Birmingham's has always had a, a really vibrant social scene do you, do you see that recovery i would imagine so i think um in due course i think people you know want to to come together don't they i think that they'll want to get back out we've seen um you know the certainly the, the restaurant and bar scene in the last 10 years in, in Birmingham just explode and something we're all you know, incredibly proud of now and um, you know, going through a particularly hard time with COVID but you know I feel that that that, that sense of vibrancy you know that's what we're going to drive back towards don't we and and we should do you know we should get that. You know, the fundamentals are strong here in the region and I think that um, as you said that sort of the nightlife scene will Will, will flourish as well and you know we've got a massive um university and college sector here you know, we're a really young city and again i think that will draw or allow us to maintain that that sense of energy which has been one of the hallmarks of uh this sort of period in the last 10 years that we've seen birmingham sort of find its mojo brilliant okay well i i don't have any further questions so um so all that remains paul is to me to thank you um, for your time today and for presenting to us and to our guests. Um, we're really, really grateful for your time and for sharing your views today. Um, as um, uh, some of you on the call will know, uh, Paul has supported us before by speaking at one of our lunches, which we actually held in the office. 
Um, and we hope uh, that we can see him and everyone attending uh, uh, today in person uh, very, very soon. Uh, we'll also keep you notified of further events that we run uh, uh, that might be of interest to you. Many thanks.